Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, me da mucho gusto presentar a la profesora Sofía Ananiadú. Ella es eh, la fundadora, la creadora del Centro Nacional de Minería de Textos en Inglaterra. Eh, fue una competencia muy dura, según recuerdo, este, eran tres grupos que estaban luchando por eh, crear un centro nacional sobre minería de textos y a nivel nacional. Eh, y bueno, eh, la propuesta que tuvo el grupo de Sofía Ananiadú realmente fue el que tuvo el éxito de tener el, este centro que está actualmente en Manchester, asociado a la eh, Universidad de Manchester, pero bueno, eh, este centro realmente ha trabajado con muchas áreas, principalmente en el área de biomedicina, eh, y bueno, hay gente de procesamiento de lenguaje natural, de inteligencia artificial, de machine learning, eh, que están trabajando eh, ampliamente en distintos proyectos, han hecho varias cosas, y bueno, pues nos va a presentar eh, algo de lo más reciente que tiene sobre eh, extracción de información eh, neural, eh, con redes neuro, eh, neuronales. Entonces, eh, les dejo la, a la doctora Sofía Naniadú que pues, nos haga su presentación, va a ser en inglés y bueno, pues ya las preguntas serán en inglés. Muchas gracias. Okay. Uh, buenos días, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here in Mexico City to give this talk. So um, I changed slightly the, my, my, the title into from neural information extraction to relation and event, but still neural information extraction from the biomedical literature. So um, I will talk um, a bit about uh, the recent work we've been doing on uh, name entity recognition, on uh, relation extraction, uh, mostly uh, unsupervised techniques. We've developed unsupervised, but I will not focus on this and event extraction, which is very important for biomedical information extraction, and uh, events are quite important for several applications. And I will mention a bit um, also the um, applications that have been developed on the basis of this uh, research. So a few words about um, uh, the center I'm um, uh, directing uh, since uh, 2004. Uh, ma mainly, um, we are using natural language processing techniques, so we are doing theoretical work, but we are translating to applications, so text mining is an application of NLP. And uh, we have developed several tools, like uh, name and recognizers, tigers, extractors, terminology, etc., uh, and also resources, and the resources are um, dictionaries, but also labeled data, annotated data, which are very helpful to, to train systems. We also developed infrastructure, and the infrastructure is, um, which I won't mention here, are um, uh, methods like, for instance, pipeline, is like um, an infrastructure to allow us to combine different tools and components, modules. Um, so, um, so the applications are several, and of course I, won't, I don't have the time to talk about that. I'll mention a bit semantic search, and uh, also um, um, a, a technique that we have developed to curate automatically networks for biology, pathway networks, uh, based on uh, NLP and un uncertainty. So um, the work that we have been doing, but as I said, it's impossible to talk about that, uh, I'll talk about nestness as well in, uh, in uh, name entity recognition. But um, other applications were how to support uh, systematic reviews based on uh, and screening, and that is basically systematic reviews that have search, screening, and summarization. Um, we worked on summarization and text simplification. Uh, also identifying uh, misinformation, misleading information, uh, techniques that um, find um, uh, uncertainty or corroborating information from text, and what very often uh, other things, techniques that support the um, uh, argument mining in, in, from scientific papers. 
And then from uh, the development of annotated corpora, we have developed um, uh, methods and tools as well, developed tools that support uh, the um, automation of uh, support of uh, annotated data based on uh, generative techniques for crowdsourcing and active and proactive learning. And a lot of work on emotion detection. It's just to give you a, an idea of the work we've been doing. Um, I think you know all that because most of you, you're NLP people, right? Uh, so um, I don't need to say much. You know how the whole thing works. Uh, so I'll focus more on, so obviously we're doing the circle from information retrieval to um, information extraction. And um, uh, clearly you all know that in the end what we want to do is to have um, annotations uh, such as this. All my examples are going to be from biology. So we have, um, you know, disorders, etc., or events. So the idea is, uh, and of course we're using dictionaries and ontologies. Um, so the name entities, uh, I'm just going to talk a bit about that. Um, again, I'm, I was not so sure if it was only NLP people or people from computer science, so certain things might be very easy for you. Um, this is an example of uh, a name entity, which is a word or a group of words that uh, constitutes a proper name, so it's, it's E-G-T-A. And um, we have the entity type, the semantic uh, category, for instance, chemical here. And the important part, because very often we do span-based and NER, the entity span, all the words that uh, are included in that entity. And this is an example of one is one word, or an acronym, and then uh, the other one is two words and it's a, a protein. Um, so again, the input we know it's a textual snippet and the output is a label for each token in the sentence. So the, typically, again, in most cases, we have to predefine the name entities. Um, it's, uh, the more granular they are, the more if you have fine-grained name entity recognition, it tends to, to pose problems of having good um, performance. But currently, in most of the cases we are doing, they have uh, almost human performance in, in several cases. Um, so the usefulness, um, um, we, we know that, uh, that they're clearly the most important items for the downstream tasks, like relation and event extraction. Um, and also, they have uh, different challenges. And one of the challenges is that they have lots of nestness, and as you see here, in the, um, let me find, if I do that. Yes, this one. So this is uh, interleukin-2, it's a protein. It is embedded with DNA, so this is a nested. And here you have a drug and uh, uh, you have another span, which is an ADE and region. And so we have polysemy here. So there is, a, it's very important to um, be able to, in order to um, disambiguate the spans, to be able to extract the nested entities. Um, and often, obviously, we're needing uh, additional context from different sentences to do that. So the um, uh, techniques that uh, we have um, uh, used uh, uh, in uh, doing entity recognition in the past, we started from rule-based methods. And um, acronyms are very important in biomedicine, so we have to use, you can use rule-based or even uh, regular expressions to recognize the na you know, name entities and acronyms, uh, term frequency, etc. but then we're going more to feature engineering methods like uh, CRFs, which have been very successful with several features, which have been lexical, syntactic, and lexical. Um, but in increasingly, as we all know, we're developing, we're focusing on deep learning techniques, uh, C CNNs and CRFs, uh, different uh, character level embeddings, uh, RNN with characters, etc., and uh, uh, transfer learning with using um, uh, different pre-trained language models, which are all, always also very uh, specific for biomedicine. So here, uh, a bio BERT or clinical BERT are um, quite, you know, specific instantiations of BERT for biomedicine. Um, so um, um, to deal with uh, uh, nested entities, uh, typically we are, uh, earlier work, and I'm going to focus on that, um, still depended on quite um, 
handcrafted features or uh, domain knowledge. So, but most recently, and this is the work by uh, Lample, which I don't know if it's here, um, uh, we used the neural models that um, they did not consider dependencies between the name entities. So, um, and by dependencies, uh, we mean how uh, the appearances of outer entities within the inner entities. Um, and we use different also pre-trained uh, uh, word embeddings to use inner entities as input to, out to outer entities. Uh, so obviously I'm going to say that briefly because uh, uh, if you were interested in this work is uh, I think here. Uh, no, it's not here. Uh, it's a paper we have submitted, we have uh, published a few years ago on nested NER. So this uh, model is really based on a um, sequential uh, stack uh, of uh, flat. So um, we, we have flat NER layers uh, that detect the nested entities from an end-to-end -end manner. So um, the flat NER layers are inspired by um, a, a model which has been uh, uh, proposed by Lample, basically, Lample in 2016. So each NER layer consists of a single LSTM layer and also a CRF layer. So if you have the sentence here, mouse interleukin 2 receptor alpha gene receptor, contains the two entities. One is protein and uh, the other is DNA. So you first stack the flat NER layer to identify the inner entity interleukin 2, which is best further used as an input to identify the uh, other layers. So um, the reason uh, uh, this is uh, working, the model stops basically um, stacking flat NER layers until no more entities are detected. Um, so um, the ma main take out of this uh, work is that it um, reuses the same flat NER layers extracts entities from inside to outside and uses dependencies between the nested entities. And it's also important, is independent of external resources because most of the work is actually using external resources. And this is, um, and that's the paper here in Jew et al. in at NACL. So um, this is the comparison with other similar methods. Now this is uh, old work, obviously. Um, we stopped working on nested entities, and other groups have picked up a lot on this work, and for biomedicine for other work, and uh, they have improved this performance. So the next uh, item uh, aspect I'm going to discuss is name entity normalization. So here we have, if for instance, is uh, TP, I cannot see, is TP53 the same as P53? And you know, what's the meaning of that? So we talk, uh, this is what we normally talk about, anti name entity linking and name entity disambiguation. So obviously what we want to do here is to assign unique identifiers to each name entity we have identified based on different references. And this is very common work and lots of people are working on that. We use dictionaries, thesauri, because it's in biomedicine mesh terms, Ontologies like KEBI or Bioportal. So there are several ontologies in the, the good thing in the biomedical field. There are many, many existing resources that we can leverage. And uh, because we're also working in the, in the bio, this is also clinical, but bio, biological, like Uniprot, protein structures, or gene bank and drug bank. So how does, uh, in principle, it works? So we have uh, an NER, which we described uh, before. Uh, SARS was able to induce greater LIAR1. Then um, we generate candidates. Here are candidates of acronyms, so expanded forms. Interleukin alpha, receptor antagonist, receptor type 1, with different uh, unique um, IDs from Uniprot. And then we try to do the disambiguation, which can happen either text-based or graph-based. So in this case, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, the example, can be linked to uh, uniprot, which is a different type for proteins, and gene, and ensemble. So as we can see here, and, and to finish that, so you can link with the additional context. 
This is the example how we are linking with a database and also with um, a, a, a graph based, with a graph. So this is just a very simple way and been, uh, we've been used different ways to do the entity linking and, and normalization. It's an extremely important part of the whole process. And the important part here is that we have also several resources that uh, will allow us to, um, to do that. So I'm going to uh, now uh, very briefly, because I spoke about the first part, the name entities, what is an application of this, uh, uh, how name entities can be used to do semantic search. And this is a work we, all those things are on our website. Uh, it's a semantic search engine that we have developed that does faceted semantic search based on the name entities. And this is based on the whole of PubMed, uh, which are abstracts. So we selected eight types, but obviously you can use more. Uh, those are indicative of the domain, but you can make them as granular as you wish. So um, um, here we see the example. We can go on our website. You have different metadata facets. And those are the journals that you find those, the, um, the authors, uh, the, the years. And here is um, the search results. If I, um, for instance, put the query, which is an acronym, very common by medicine, like GAD, Typically, I have many, many documents back about a ten or thousands. So we immediately we have that, then the entity facets, which assigns uh, the, an acronym to specific. Um, it could be a protein or, a, a, for instance, a, a disease. Now, behind um, this is the front end, obviously, but in the back end we have um, besides the name entity recognition. We have acronym uh, recognition and acronym disambiguation, which I'm not going to discuss today. But um, again, there are various uh, ways of uh, doing acronym expansion. Uh, and this um, disamb disambiguation allows you to link the acronym with different, uh, to expand it with different databases. So on the basis of that, um, we now, uh, the next step is we, we find a document has been already automatically marked up with the name entities. If you can see, you have access to PubMed. And also, uh, you can use, uh, uh, you can get information about another entity, linking it to different databases. So how does it work? How do you filter? GED has two possible forms, full forms, expansions. One is a gene, which is the glutamic acid dexa and the other is a generalized anxiety disorder, the disease. So this is why it's important to have the facet. By disambiguating the acronym in the search strategy, we reduce the number of articles from the 8,000, which are there, to, as you can see here, to 1,000. And that's quite important because just the simple name entity recognition with disambiguation you um, reduce, you increase the specificity of your search. Um, so um, here we have an example of that to talk about the acronym disambiguation. And based on facets, you can also create um, different types of searches. Here is, uh, for instance, you can uh, look at, um, um, I cannot see here. Yes, for instance, uh, uh, you have uh, a gene uh, GAD, but you want to combine it in your search with uh, a disease, schizophrenia. So this allows you to narrow down, to zoom in and zoom out your search. So that's uh, my, you know, um, basically, I'll, I'll conclude this part, where I mention name entities, and the normalization, and also um, nested terms, uh, and name entities which are very uh, important in biomedicine, a bit tackling the acronyms, I cannot talk about the methods because I don't have the time. An application which shows that the name entity with the acronyms uh, in the back end disambiguation can provide, um, can increase specificity in our search and uh, provide um, faceted semantic search. So um, that's it. So the next part now, obviously, in information is again relations and um, uh, the, I won't have the, the time to talk about syntactic and form. 
So I will discuss about uh, sentence-based, again, medication drug associations and uh, gene chemical interactions. So again, relation extraction is a basic component. You need to have the name entities, this is the important part. It's a basic component for other downstream tasks, uh, event extraction, question answering, etc. And the apl applications are too many to describe, but the, an obvious one is to uh, construct knowledge bases automatically from text. Um, so you can find, for instance, reactions which are associated with drugs. Um, so examples, again, of the usefulness, so those are um, um, patterns from raw text. So injury disrupts uh, physiological function or um, bodily location of biological function, etc. cetera. So um, uh, as I mentioned before, they can be the, an important part for other tasks. Uh, you can use not only for question answering, but uh, also for summarization and other areas. Um, so what are the uh, kind of brief of the taxonomy? Um, we have um, the textual extraction tasks. We have domain or generic, which is in general language, but also biomedical. Um, here we, we can work on, on clinical text, but, co but also on clinical reports or uh, scientific lit literature, but also electronic health records. Another part is the textual granularity. Um, typically, they are sentence-based, but increasingly are at paragraph and document um, level, which um, um, we encounter other challenges when we're going beyond sentences. And then different arguments, uh, binary and nary. And we have the different types. We can work on concepts, on words, um, on events, on mentions. And also, um, uh, the semantic categories could be uh, predefined, uh, could be binary, uh, like relation, no relation. But uh, very often we use, uh, we do multi class and multi label. Um, and um, the, you can have an automatic uh, relation extraction, semantic categories, based on clusters, okay, text base. So um, the most common. Till now, although there is a lot of work on uh, different techniques, is uh, sentence-based binary. Uh, but increasingly, actually, too often now, people work at sentence-based. Um, some of the challenges that uh, we have in relation extraction, uh, which I will discuss now, is um, the aliases. And that takes us back to the words, the variants, the variation of uh, words. Um, so we need to be able to pick up in a relation the entities that and it's the entity normalization, uh, coreference, uh, polysemy, uh, negation, but also um, the other types of, uh, besides negation, it's uncertainty uh, and other types of uh, knowledge which are important for extracting uh, relations. And also hypernymy and eponymy. Um, other challenges as, as well, the very distant arguments, which we'll see now, the implicit relation. So you have, you're trying to extract information, but then there are other entities that you have to infer the relations and domain specific knowledge. So uh, very quickly, the, um, the, the challenges here are uh, the analysis that I mentioned before and the normalization. What is another word for paracetamol? And you can have the, the drug name, like the, the brand name as uh, Tylenol or, or, or whatever. So those are basically, um, you know, the name meant is because they have different uh, um, aliases, you need to link them together. Other um, um, uh, uh, problems, challenges, is the um, hierarchies between the, the entities, which is imponymy and hypernymy. We use ontologies to allow us to find these associations, like is, a, is an hypernym, and you have different subsumptions between the classes, as a giraffe, is a ruminant, is an ungulate, etc. Um, and last is also, not last, I mean, there are also negation that um, alternates meet in the meaning. So you have uh, neither rhinotine nor EGT inhibited. Um, so you need to be able to, to know that this relationship of inhibited is negative. 
But this can be expressed in different ways. You don't have to have not or neither. You can have blocked. So this is negation. This is not a positive uh, uh, relation. Um, and then you have the, the long the, uh, distant uh, arguments, which is still quite difficult, but um, you have lots of intermediate, especially in scientific text. Um, you see here the name entities bilateral optic neuropathy, that you want to find the relation. The isoniazid is quite far away, and you have intermediate uh, parenthetical sentences. Um, and then is the discourse. Um, and uh, here, uh, one example is um, from electronic health records. You have Bactrim, Rash. So basically, this, it's implicit that this type of uh, drug causes Rash. It's an adverse drug event. Um, and also the temporality of uh, relations. So you have a patient had two transfusion reactions, and then it says she was premeditated with antihistamine. So you need to be able to find that, that the, this, part, this part of the relation was fair. So temporality in um, clinical text is extremely important. So um, um, the context again, uh, so we want to also the context in, in relation extraction is, uh, and this has, I spent some, uh, perhaps five minutes talking about that, is what I said before, so Bactrim is a drug and RAS, it's a limited context. Um, so it's not present. We need, to, for instance, to infer the relationship. Uh, we, we, we know it's the result of the allergy, but we need to be able to model it. Uh, but there are some uh, positive things as well that um, patterns and the different expressions um, they're specific that uh, medical prescriptions follow. So you have um, a pattern drug strength and form, um, and that allows us to identify semantic types between uh, entities and um, find also the directionality of the relationships. Um, let me see here. So the last one is really something we can take advantage. So I'll talk uh, a bit about the work of uh, Fenya, my PhD student, who uh, we developed some, we did some work on uh, uh, medication on uh, relation extraction, both at um, uh, sentence level and at, at document level. And the whole idea there was that um, uh, most of the challenges in uh, relation extraction, uh, they don't model the interactions basically between pairs. So they assume there's one relation, right? So um, they, assume, they assume a single pair uh, per sentence. And very often, additionally, they use the depend on external semantic tools um, that often result in uh, domain-specific models. So the uh, motivation was to actually uh, find the relations between the entities that can be supported by coexisting pairs of relations in the same sentence. So we use uh, additional pairs of relations in the sentence to extract, to even improve the relationship we wanted to extract in the first place. Um, so um, let me give you an example here. So in this example, we need to find the relation between uh, hypotension and atropine. However, the relation is not evident when we first read the sentence. So we need to be able now to find as well, we can infer this relation uh, between hypotension and atropine. So this is um, by looking, extracting the relationships between, as you see here, AD and drug, a hypotension and dopamine, and dopamine and atropine. Uh, we um, use these additional interactions, drug, drug, and AD drug, uh, even if they're not annotated in the corpus, to extract, and want to extract AD and drug. So this is important when we don't have enough context, okay, or we don't have enough information, when, you know, we don't have many contextual words present. So we are using the ideas to use additional sentence, additional uh, relations. Um, so the way, um, the, the way to, uh, the method was very simple, is to map uh, the sentences in a graph where the nodes are the entities in the sentence and the edges are the representations of relations in the sentence. So 
Um, we basically, uh, well, we did that, and the, the model, the method was the, um, a walk-based model on entity graphs for relation extraction. After we construct the edges, we start uh, to find, to model the chains of interactions between the target entities. Um, so we, there are two types of, um, two steps in the walk-based layer. Uh, so it's the, the walk uh, generation and the walk aggregation. So we, during the walk uh, um, uh, generation, we combine the two direct associations into an indirect one. So um, we have here the direct, the hypotension, the, the, the red ones, and they're combined into a, an indirect association, which is the, you know, the dopamine, so from hypotension to atropine. And then the next part is actually, i put it here. No, I don't want that, sorry. Uh, okay. So um, during now the walk um, aggregation, we combine what we say the old, what was the red, direct association, with the, with the new, which is the, the, uh, the indirect, the dopamine, to create a new association, the blue one, uh, which is the hypotension and atropine. So there are two steps. Uh, the, um, you have um, the, the old, which is the red, the direct, the new, the yellow, the indirect representation, um, into a new single representation, which is the, the uh, updated. Now those edges are updated using both uh, direct and direct associations. And they keep on on, you repeat this uh, um, all the time to form edges with longer walks uh, till in the end to so sort you stop. So uh, I won't explain all the paper because you can find it. But the important part to, see, to, to mention here is that we wanted to find if by adding um, additional uh, drug, drug, um, to find if the addition of drug, drug interactions can help us these were not actually uh, annotated, if we can actually model the performance. So um, we found that uh, by adding that, we could benefit other types of relations which were not explicitly rela uh, mentally mentioned. The other part now we to, to look at is relation extraction beyond sentences, because I mentioned only uh, at sentence level. And in this case, uh, the relations uh, between the entities, uh, they can, we can look them at entity-based. So we have oxytocin and oct, so they're, they're really, we consider the occurrence of each entity as a different name entity. And in the second uh, scenario, we consider the multiple occurrences as, uh, of an entity as, the man, as concepts, as ma multiple mentions. So oxytocin and oct, or oct are the same thing. Uh, so in this case, uh, this actually helped us to do to learn to do multi-instance learning by learning using multiple instances of the same entity. Um, the, uh, very briefly, um, for, it, for to do the inference here on again, it's a graph-based model. When we're doing, we construct a graph. We also use inference and classification. Now, for inference, we use the walk-based model that I um, briefly mentioned before. Um, and now the difference is the graph itself is quite heterogeneous. We have entities, we have the mentions, and we have sentences. And this allows us to have multiple types of edges. We can have uh, mention, mention, mention entity, etc. cetera. Uh, I mentioned the walk-based model. So, um, the, the, maze or the, the basically the model creates new paths between the nodes or you can update existing paths. Um, so I, I think uh, I'm not gonna describe the different layers that we have, but perhaps um, I think an important part here is to mention that the graph is not fully instantiated. So you don't have, you have specific, you are, you are um, updating the edges instead of the nodes. 
Most graph-based models and data were using updating the nodes, but in this case, because we're doing relations, we update uh, the nodes, and that's an important part. I think I might skip the experimental evaluation and because I want to talk to about events. So um, um, this is the last part of my talk. And uh, although I'm most probably I won't have time to talk about nested inverse and uncertainty, again, in my medicine, the, the notion of nestness is very important for the same reasons, because they're, as you will see, they're very embedded. And um, we have developed techniques to do nested event recognition. Um, so here we see, again, an example of, um, in biology, again, of uh, an event. So we have um, a, a type, which is gene expression here. So there, it's a gene expression. Events have triggers, and this is the trigger. And they have uh, themes like Aurora B, which is a protein, a name entity. And that's a second event. Uh, so obviously now from binary relations, we go to nary relations. And this is phosphorylation, where the type is phosphorylation. The trigger is this. And we have the theme, this protein. And also we have the causality. Now, that's not uh, to, to continue to see the nestness. We have also um, another event here, which is uh, positive regulation, enhances. And the trigger is enhanced. And as arguments, takes this event as another argument. The theme is another event. So this is um, uh, for you to understand, for us to understand the complexity of extracting events and nested events in uh, biomedicine. And that's the anatomy. So we know we talk about event, event mention, the words comprising the event in a document. We have uh, an event type, the class label. So uh, for instance, expression, the trigger, which is detection of triggers. Uh, what expresses the event, like um, expression, phosphorylation, enhances. The arguments, you have the different aurora here, other events that, that are participants of the attribute, and the argument role, the relationship between an argument and the event. Oh, I'm not doing it well, sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Um, Okay. <laughs> okay. And then we are basically extracting different templates, but I won't go into that. So this is um, in very important in order to develop in specific applications for networks, biomedical networks. The recognition of events is a sine qua non. We need to do that. And um, they're very useful. Uh, because uh, here are the areas. I mean, obviously, I'm working a lot in the bio domain, in pharmaco pharmacogenetics, at, in different translation of genomics, in cancer research. All these uh, um, areas who are very practical need that. Uh, but also, um, uh, what we are trying to do is, is one way that um, links uh, knowledge with text. And this is a very good example because, as you've seen, they're a bit higher level. You have a trigger like enhances, and uh, the event is like positive regulation. So if you want to link the knowledge, the biological knowledge with text, it's a, a way of actually supporting that, to, that knowledge discovery. You can use them as well to do search based on these types of events. As we had faceted search for entities, you can have for relations, and you can have for biological events. Um, so again, uh, the different categories that we have, as to give you an analysis. Um, I'm doing the time, I'm okay. So um, again, you can do, obviously, events. Uh, if you used the, the corporate, like MUC, they had events as well, like a terrorist event. So again, the gen generic language. Um, and you can have it in uh, newswire, financial reports. And also in biomedical, clinical, uh, clinical re re reports, and scientific um, literature. Now it could be closed. We can have predefined templates or more open-ended. Till now we had more, so you have uh, not specific templates for candidates of events or arguments. 
And the granularity could be at sentence pace, but we did a lot or across uh, documents or paragraph. And the complexity is, again, as I mentioned with the, the entities, they're flat. So you have an event, which you saw event one, but then the nested, if you remember, the event, uh, um, the third event had two other events embedded. So they're um, nested events. The different um, um, types of challenges, uh, just to summarize, is first of all, you have overlapping arguments. So you can have events with different types of arguments which are related to different events. Then we have coreference, which is, uh, again, at, at document level, or even at one sentence, at a single sentence, you might have pronouns and you might be able to, to link uh, between different entities. Polysemy, multiple types per argument, multiple roles, semantic roles per argument, distant uh, also arguments, you have uh, intersentence and intrasentence, and then um, uh, partial, their uh, events, or as I mentioned, and also modifiers, and in the modifiers we worked a lot, and especially on the negation and uh, uncertainty, uh, but the um, Analysis, uh, recognition of modifiers is very important if you want to also rank events for different applications because uh, it's not just extracting a specific type of event, it's actually to an analyze the whole context. Uh, an example of that, of the um, coreference, is the entity is represented uh, by a pronoun, as we all know, or an abstract mention. So um, you have um, the sentence one, so you have the um, IR to promote the region, and then you have the region. So it's mentioned the same, it's the same thing. It's inducible uh, by both interference. So the entity trigger representation, which is important, is mentioned in another sub-sentence. So uh, to summarize some of the, the challenges, um, you have um, coreference, uh, the trigger, as I said, might uh, overlap fully or partially with another event uh, uh, trigger. An event could be an argument to other events. Um, and very often, uh, when you have the nestness, the depth of the underlying event graph can expand. Um, and also, the, what we call the context, the modifier or meta-knowledge is important. Um, so I think I'll, I'll skip that because I mentioned it before uh, about the overlapping event, but that's a good example. You have um, a flat event uh, uh, cell transformation, and uh, this um, flat event has a theme argument uh, from cell entity, um, which is a erythroid cells, and the positive regulation transformed is a nested event with a cell transformation event as its theme. And the organism is um, entity as a cause. So we have now transformed that uh, there are two triggers that share the same textual span. Transform is on positive regulation and cell transformation. Uh, so we call also the triggers, those words as nested triggers as well because they're referring to two um, if, basically events. Um, so um, I, we, developed, um, uh, we developed several tools for event extraction. One was um, um, more on the pipeline methods, uh, using more traditional machine learning, SVM, but uh, recently we also developed an end-to-end, -end, a joint learning neural event extraction uh, called the Deep Event Mine. I, am, I don't uh, really have much time to talk about this, but basically it uses, uh, has different layers. Uh, it, well, it's BERT, of course, assigns contextual representations. You have entity trigger, you have a role, and the event layers. And uh, the entity and trigger layer uh, assigns um, 
entity or trigger types to overlapping text spans. And um, then, uh, I mean, I don't want to spend time because it's a whole talk on this. And then the role layer uh, enumerates all the trigger argument pairs. And then you have the event layer who looks at the combinations of role pairs to construct event candidates. Um, and here we recognize, of course, um, uh, nestness. And um, uh, we are looking at uh, different events which are also modified, like speculation and negation. Um, we have developed, uh, this is a very, in this case, the nestness has been done in a bottom-up manner, in the simplest manner. So we classify the events with no trigger arguments. So we call, we call them flat events. And then we repeat the process to obtain nested events, which contain these trigger arguments. Um, so basically, you construct nested events by replacing the trigger arguments by their corresponding detective events. We have developed other methods to, to um, recognize nestedness, which I will not describe now. Um, OK, this is a very niche, perhaps, area. Not many people are working on the biomedical event extraction. And typically, um, we, we compared our model with uh, state-of-the-art uh, models on, on five tasks. Um, because it's supervised, we used uh, annotated data, like um, cancer genetics. It's from shared tasks we have developed a few years ago. Uh, the Genia corpus, which is very well, um, is very much used in our field as a, as a gold standard. Uh, a, a corpus on infectious disease and uh, multi-level also event extraction data sets. So there, there are various, uh, we compared with, um, um, with different uh, other, other people's approaches, like the TESS uh, from Finland. And, uh, and there is also the BioMNL. So we see that um, um, most of the, in most cases, uh, we, it outperforms other systems in different five data sets. And the, 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 the ones I mentioned before are gold standards. Um, so um, again, if you're interested in this, there is uh, the paper of Deep Event Mind and also another paper on uh, nested events. So, apologies for that. So the last part, perhaps, is the, the augmentation of events and the um, modifiers and what we call also meta-knowledge. So um, uh, those are some nice examples here. Based on our experiments, MUC binds weekly to PM, PKM. So you have uh, an observation, a knowledge type like observation, then a manner weekly. Uh, investigation, and then you have, um, we wanted to investigate whether binds. So uh, if you take, um, extract this information as, you know, an event or a an event or a relation, you cannot say that the MUC binds with MKM2 because it's not certain. We want to investigate whether. And another part is also according to, so you have a source, so you, again, MUC, uh, MUC1 is negative, cannot bind, but not according to the author of the paper, but according to somebody else. So those are several um, interesting um, aspects to examine. This is a very active uh, also type of research. We work a lot, we continue working on negation, where we, we want to find certain elements. The one is uh, citation analysis as well you can incorporate. If we want to look at the network, say who is saying what, then we, can, we are able to rank the events based on other types of information. And one is the meta-knowledge, and the other is citation analysis as well. Why this is important is because if you want to uh, pinpoint important events or relations in text to say, for instance, do an experiment, you want to be as certain as possible. This is why we looked at uncertainty. Um, so those are some of the dimensions. This is some old work, but uh, again, a lot of exploration because um, uh, we have uh, developed the annotated corpora that people can use. 
but there is a lot of um, research from based on in these areas of finding the manner and all that. This can be actually ways of ranking and uh, you know information, and a bit more on the sentences for to see exactly how um, basically the same. You have uh, results in multiple. You have multiple evidence uh, passages supporting the same interaction. But obviously, not all event mentions are, have the same uncertainty. You have a strong speculation, a whistling, frequency limit, admission of lack of knowledge, etc. So uh, I'm not mentioning how we did that, because there's a paper on this, um, using uh, subjective logic. But it's a very uh, interesting way of uh, uh, doing, of uh, ranking and uh, uh, contextualizing the events. So now I'm finishing with this to see um, why we did all that. And this is, those are the pathways. So those are cancer pathways. So the medics, clinicians, and biologists working in all sorts of uh, health aspects, they're creating these uh, pathways or networks. Now what's happening, these are created manually. And I mean, they're reading the literature and they're finding the different entities and they link them together. So what we have is it's impossible with the amount of literature publishing to, to um, create models which are actually um, up to date. It's, it's really impossible. Then, um, uh, because the task is uh, completely manual, and uh, there's no way uh, by, by not being able to do that, this is what's happening, this is the next thing. So again, this is a bit, well, I'm not a biologist, but still. <laughs> so medic, you know, people, this is a pathway, okay. And those are actually different types of analysis, people doing experiments based on pathways, and those are knowledge bases, and different other, other omics data. Now, if this is manual, if you're doing experiments based on manual information, you realize that your experiments are a bit Naive, you, you know, you, you, you're not able to, to put out to date of, us, of the information in the in literature. So all the things that I mentioned now about events especially, is to be able to link those reactions and models, the, those are biological models, to what we find in text. And by doing that, we're able to uh, flux analysis, actually understanding the dynamics of different interactions in, um, in, in, in the models. Um, so um, the two things, uh, the first thing we did was to old work to create a system which was um, very novel because it was the first time that we were linking these models which were in a markup language for biology, it's SBML, Systems Biology Markup Language, to basically the text but we were not ranking um, documents. We're not just finding information from documents. We are ranking the information from reactions, and the reactions were the events. And um, the next, um, uh, the last uh, work we have done, which was putting together all the things I said, is the Lead Path Explorer. And this um, was telling us that if you want to uh, explore and update the pathway, you need to do it based on some kind of confidence. So it's a search system, again, we developed for pathways, but this search system retrieves the information from text, ranks it according to certainty and other aspects, and then facilitates, augments basically automatically the pathway by using the new interactions. And there is also the human in the loop, the biologist, which is um, um, looking at the information that we are developing to basically corroborate or not. So, um, so here is actually a kind of uh, the pipeline of the technique. So I cannot see it very well here. So here we have, um, uh, the lead, we developed the Lead Path Explorer from scratch. So you have uh, those, here are the, the nodes, and those are the events, the edges, the phosphorylation. So you start by um, uh, 
uh, a search method of uh, putting a, you know, trying to find uh, an interaction or a, or a node you can search from an event or a protein catabolism or even um, um, an entity. Then what you're doing in the discovery, you are linking, uh, you're, you're finding here, you have all those dotted lines, which are, this is the known and this is new, automatically discovered from the documents. And this is uh, now the quantified confidence and you have the polarity, and uh, this is uh, the, you know, a bit of the uncertainty I was discussing before, but you can have other techniques like citations, impact factor, etc., and also citation analysis. So this, this type of methods are very interesting, again, because, uh, I'm gonna put me that, so, um, and you can also visualize, uh, so you can see here you have a, a, an entity, and all the sentences which are um, relevant, they are automatically extracted and ranked according to um, the certainty, the type of certainty. Um, so it's actually been what I said before. Uh, you can search based on types, on entities, uh, or even uh, add semantic roles. So this is a kind of template that we're using. So it's quite complex, so you can use events to do search and to update a, a, a pathway. Um, so once, for instance, you search for the entity uh, MAK, uh, we retrieve all the entities in the pathway model that they have this entity MAK as one of their entities. And we start visualizing the network. And as I said, there are two types of entities, the entities and also the reactions, which are the events. Uh, and we have different types, as we know, you know now, it could be protein catabolism or phosphorylation. And here is uh, to see the evidence, um, the automatically extracted different types of events and the confidence, different types of confidence. It's a positive sentence because we're using the polarity in the different multi-level at sentence level, but also at document level. And uh, it's interactive because um, we can use uh, user feedback uh, to uh, take into account and use a neural net to basically uh, improve the, the certain information that we have. Um, so um, if we want to expand, um, extend the model, um, we use the activate the discovery, we activate the discovery mode, which is here, okay? And this is how it's used. But as you can see, all this is new information. And in order to be able to uh, work on that, we use fusion, okay, and confidence to be able to explore specific paths of the network. Uh, so um, if you have too many event candidates, it's cumbersome, you cannot explore. And this is where you, you can fuse things which are redundant. And also you can use the confidence, you can have higher confidence to allow the user to focus and uh, for those are more likely to be true. Um, and that's about it. And um, so, um, so basically I wanted to talk about uh, biomedical information extraction and how we use that to, to develop search systems and also the pathways. And we're working um, a lot, uh, uh, continue to work on negation um, and uh, improving basically the types of uh, rankings that we're using. And another uh, important area for us is the integration of heterogeneous information. So it's not only text and um, scientific literature or different types of text, but also integrating knowledge bases, also citation graphs. Um, and do more advanced uh, literature uh, because one of the, when you find, once you find associations, you can use uh, different data mining techniques to do more advanced um, discovery. Uh, and I mentioned the application, so thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Uh, Well, uh, if the 
Meanwhile, uh, it's quite interesting uh, how the NACTEM have uh, has a um, work in 20 years uh, <coughs> applying uh, NLP for a uh, bio uh, and all the tools uh, that you have developed and all the uh, information you can extract. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing your talk, uh, thank you very much. Uh, but I, I wonder, uh, first, uh, is possible, even when the main literature is in English, but it's possible to transfer these uh, tools, this uh, knowledge, uh, to extract uh, the same information in Spanish? Yeah, uh, yeah it's a good. Uh, so we, we worked, um, first of all, we did NLP. Uh, those are, I try to make it a bit more to understand um, that this type, if you're doing uh, fundamental research, and this is the part of your answer to your question, you can apply it to real applications, you can translate it. So the methods, for instance, relation extraction or the name entry recognition, of course, those, all these techniques are transferable. And there are various, uh, so first of all, you can use transfer learning, you can create different types, you can use different corpora to acquire. All of these techniques can be applied to Spanish. And, and that would be very interesting. I don't know, I don't know in the sense, the events, I'm not so sure because most of the scientific literature is written this type of in, in English. Uh, but what you definitely, it's interesting, is of course the name entities and the nested, for instance, for, for Spanish, uh, and also the relations at this course level, and look at, uh, looking at modality, the meta-knowledge for Spanish, definitely this is transferable to other languages. Okay, the, and that's, something that one that's, can explain. That's the first uh, yeah. way because another thing that I am thinking is that if we do that in, in Spanish, uh, we can, of course, uh, get the information in Spanish, but it's possible to have translingual uh, extraction. Yeah, you can, you, you, uh, although this is not an area I'm working on, but we, we've worked in the past on aligning, mostly on terminology uh, between different languages. But uh, you can uh, align this type of relations, corpora, and information from, from English to Spanish. Uh, so you can, uh, you can think, especially in, a, I don't know, in a, but this is again my area, there is a lot of work on cross-lingua information extraction, where you have in English and you have in Spanish, and you can actually learn, and the transfer learn, you can learn from Spanish or from English to acquire knowledge from Spanish. So this definitely, those are very interesting, you know, things to explore. There's a question from you. We have a question from Facebook. Uh, Andres asks, where are the texts that you analyze coming from? Is it the only abstract or the full text? Because there are a lot of references that have a paywall. Uh, yeah, okay, this is, we did abstracts, we did full papers, and there is a lot of information, lots of information now on open access. And this is why <laughs> we've been lobbying a lot. So the ones that the information, the, the open, we're working on full papers, a lot of these events, because in abstracts, it's very difficult to, um, uh, especially for events, it's very constraining. Um, so both abstracts and full papers. And for the, the ones that are not open access, and we cannot use them. There is another uh, alternative, but depends on, the, this is very, really um, legal as well and our community has worked a lot in Europe, to what extent um, universities, which are hosts and repositories of, uh, so we subscribe, say, to, have, to host the papers. In Europe, we have the right to text mine the papers, that the f all the full papers we have in our uh, um, library. So, but we cannot export. We can do it only for internal research purposes. We cannot... Um, do anything else with that. So if I create a database or a knowledge graph, uh, I'm not able to, um, to make it open. Yeah. <laughs> but we can do it on open, on open access. And uh, another thing to say is that in Europe, at least there is so much emphasis on open science, a lot of initiatives on open science, and I very much hope that um, because we've been working for many years in that aspect that we will, um, but this is mostly about legal aspects and publishers. 
Okay, another. Oh, I, I have a question. Uh, do you talk a lot about the negation challenge? And I want to know if you have a method for the negation now and how to treat it. Uh, yes, we had, uh, there is a, a, a recent paper, I didn't mention that, that we published at ACL in 2021. And we used the variational on the encoders to extract uh, negation. Uh, so, um, and um, the interesting part of that is um, because you have a, a relations and you have negation and uncertainty, so we did both. And you want to be able to disentangle the information. And uh, variational encoders is a, now we're working a lot in that area. It's a very promising way to, to, to well, we actually, um, the, the paper is by Jake Vasilakis, Vasilakis et al. Uh, and it uh, was published at ACL, uh, well, 2021. Um, so have a look at that in the VAs. And also another thing we can do, which we didn't do, we did it on events, but not on relations. We're going to use subjective logic for that as well. Um, because you look at, uh, in this case, uh, what is um, certain, what is uncertain, what is considered as ground truth. So subjective law is a very good way, but combined with variation on non toy coders. It's ongoing work, <laughs> that one. <laughs> okay. Me, uh, me again, uh, in general, uh, about the tools uh, you have uh, developed, uh, is uh, possible, uh, are they all available? Oh, they're, uh, they're all available. Everything's available and the code is available. Please use them. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Everything is open source. Okay. Questions? Facebook, no? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Sorry for that. Sophia. For the debate uh, starting. <laughs> the great uh, talk. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Bye.